It's really an honor to get invited to give closing remarks at an event like this, especially in front of the most talented 12 people in the world. And so someone clapped. And so um, it, it was funny when, when Lisa was like, hey, you want to come give closing remarks? I was like, great. I'll tell everyone to like, you know, enjoy lunch and take whatever bagels they want with them. Um, but I guess that's not appropriate. And probably we should spend a little bit of time talking about the path and things like that. And I think um, uh, I struggled for the past two months uh, to think of what to say, because I wanted to come in and give you guys great advice and be like, this is what it takes. And then I realized that most of you guys are actually probably really at the same level as me. And, and the other thing that's uh, important to note is, um, uh, you know, I got desperate and I started looking through like previous uh, plenary lectures. And one was from Harry Gray, right? And he gave this great lecture with all this great advice. And um, yeah, so it was messed up because I followed none of his advice. I actually did exactly the opposite of what Harry Gray's, Gray said to do. And actually, things turned out okay in my group. And so I, I think that you know, the message I have for you guys is that you, know, you, you gotta basically do you. You guys are already very established and successful and talented. You know, I think that it's okay to do things the way you wanna do them and the way that feels right. I think there has to be a level of congruency between you and your research and your lab, uh, ultimately, to do things right. Okay, and so, so that's great. I can't give you guys any advice, right? So, so what am I gonna say? So then I started thinking, okay, what, what was my situation? So when I got this award, I was not a, a PI yet, really. I guess I just opened my lab doors around a month ago. And so you guys like, should know that that's super stressful um, because basically you've been anointed as someone who's like one of the most talented young chemists in the world, or the US at least, and yet, for, in my case, I didn't really have anything to show for it. So that's like a lot of pressure. Thank you guys. <laughs> No problem. And so um, uh, I think, uh, where did the pressure come from? And probably some of you guys have this pressure. Some of you guys are really successful and already established and don't have that, right? But some of you guys are feeling like that, uh-oh, I'm in trouble now. Now I really have to deliver. And so um, uh, the source of that was really revolved around uh, my ideas, right? Because basically what happened that year was I came up with a bunch of things I wanted to do independently, and then I went around the country telling people and then basically fought about that with them, right? We're basically like, this idea isn't good because of this reason, that reason, and, and the other. And um, uh, that really is good because, oh, that's a picture of me, hey. <laughs> uh, that, that's really great because, you know, it strengthens your, 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 your knowledge and your, your kind of, uh, the way you think about the projects you wanna do because really smart people are criticizing them. That's great. But also it can be interesting on the ego and it can make you question whether you should be doing the things you wanna do, as an academic anyway. And so uh, today's talk is, is about that in a way. So it's confessions of a carbocation addict. And so when, when, I, when I finished up my postdoc, I had all these proposals that had been uh, serially rejected by funding agencies where I was gonna do all this really cool chemistry with carbocations. And these were the things I was so nervous about and felt all this pressure about being a, a T12 a, a person. And so despite all that pressure and, and fear, basically we decided to pursue these projects anyway. And I, I think they've turned out pretty well. Uh, I should probably acknowledge my research group. And so these folks are absolutely fantastic. They're super young. Uh, in particular, today I'm going to spend time talking about uh, uh, the work of Brian Chow and Sasek Popoff and Alex Bagdasarian, Tyler Benton, Ben Wigman, Jessica Birch, and also work from Professor Ken Hauk, Lee Yu Zhao, and Zong Yu Yang, who are collaborators at UCLA. Um, I should also say that uh, I'll also briefly mention one of the things that actually came from carbocation research. This is our, our work in the area of microcrystal electron diffraction. This is fueled by uh, 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 Tamir Gonin and Jose Rodriguez, who are biophysicists at, at, at UCLA, are structural biologists, and they kind of keyed us in on this wonderful technique that we're starting to use for organic chemistry. Uh, Lee Jun Kim, Umbernil Saha, Matt Assay, Chris Jones are the students and postdocs that work with me on these projects, uh, and, and also Mike Martinowitz and uh, Chris Jones are shown here, and these are the guys who really kind of kicked this thing off uh, in the beginning. Okay, and so. Uh, this thing about carbocation, so this is like where my insecurity came from, because when I started, all I wanted to do was basically develop a catalyst that can take this simple type of polyolefin and turn it into this polycyclic hydrocarbon. And this mimicked a, a, a reaction in nature, right? A, an enzyme called terpene cyclases, there's a variety of them, of terpene cyclases, but they take terpenes, linear terpenes like this, pyrophosphate versions and other types of terpenes and turn them into complex molecules. And then these molecules get oxidized by enzymes to make more complex secondary metabolites that are useful for medicine and things like that. And so um, it turns out that this particular intermediate, this one I have highlighted here called the bisabolyl carbocation, um, is a really important intermediate that actually leads to a whole, uh, a huge number of natural products. So all these terpene 
uh, carbocycles. You can draw diastereomers of them and install oxidation and do all this stuff. And basically, this represents a fraction of natural product space. And so what we said in our lab was, hey, if we could figure out how to, excuse me, if we could figure out how to manipulate this intermediate, we could access all of those compounds. And if we can do it in a controlled way, we would solve all sorts of problems in biomedicine and, and uh, it contribute intellectually to a variety of fields. Okay, and so this idea was really uh, not favorable when I went around the world talking. People are like, you know, when I was interviewing, people are like, you're a really good chemist, you have a great publication record, but there's two things, there were two answers, or two, two questions and answers I usually got is, is basically, this is too hard of a problem, right, so why would you do this? And then the other half of the people were like, this is a really hard problem, and even if you solved it, no one would care, right? And these are the kind of responses I got, and, and, and I will say that I didn't really care, I just went ahead and did it. Right, and so my whole group worked on this problem from the beginning, and you guys haven't seen it published because it's a really hard problem. But we are gonna publish very soon, hopefully. And, but what I will say is, after a year in the group, we had found out that we could make cadenodyne from, from a Farnesol derivative. And that, that was a really crazy reaction, so with a, a, a catalyst. And so the only other catalysts that were known that could make things like this were enzymes. And we were doing this with basically silicon catalysts. And, and this was really cool because you could take this cadenodyne and turn it into artemisinin. And this is actually the shortest total synthesis of artemisinine, and we had this in our group after a year and a half, but the yield was 8%, and so that, that, that was not great, and so we couldn't publish it, and so uh, we didn't know what to do, and basically what, what I decided to do was just drop the project. It was a year and a half, and the whole team was working on it, and we had very little time to publish our first paper and to, to make an impact on the community. And so we leveraged all this expertise, so the reagents basically we use in these types of reactions were silylium cations and weakly coordinating anions, and we took our expertise in that area, because not that many other organic chemists were, 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 uh, uh, knew how to use those types of compounds. We had another idea that was in my proposals that certainly, uh, at this point, no one really wanted to fund. But what we thought is that we could take these fluoro-TMS reagents and turn them into arines. And the way this would happen is basically this silylium would ionize a CF bond to make a phenyl carbocation, and then this would eliminate out a TMS cation to make an arine. What was cool here is we would regenerate the catalytic species. This would be a catalytic arine forming reaction. Those are really rare. They'd be potentially synthetically useful. Um, we tried this. Basically, we tried to look for dimerization of arines. That's a good way to detect their presence in solution. And we didn't see them in our first experiments. But what we did see was kind of interesting. What we saw is that we aerolated and hexane, the solvent. So for you organic chemists in the room should know that's quite remarkable. And so I guess the point here and why I give this example is basically because it just, you know, you can have really challenging ideas that you want to pursue, right? But I, I think it's not really like being successful in your proposals. It's more about the process of undertaking research, right? And so here, basically, we first had an idea where we were going to solve the terpene problem, failed at that, took what we learned from terpenes, tried to apply it to a new methodology, making an airline, for example, failed at that but along the way discovered uh, you know, a really interesting novel reaction, right? just by being observant and looking at this rea th these reactions carefully. And so what was even more interesting, I think, is that basically you know, this was our, our group's first paper. We ended up publishing it in Science Magazine. Right? The whole paper, it was funny the way we wrote the paper. I hope none of the editors are in the room. Certainly there's readers in the room. But the whole way we wrote the paper is that we were trying to do aerolation of hydrocarbons. And then we basically did a bunch of mechanistic studies proving it was an arine reaction. So that was fun. Okay, so we looked at the mechanism, and it, you know, we basically said, oh, this is a big carbon-centered LUMO. It's an electrophile. Phenyl cation's an electrophile. Let's look at that and study that. So we formulated this idea we were going to do, for you organic chemists in the room, we are going to do a Mukiyama aerolation reaction. We were going to take that same phenyl cation precursor and hit it with a nuclear file to do alpha aerolation chemistry. This is also an unsolved problem in organic chemistry, I think. And so uh, the way this would work is you'd make a phenyl carbocation, it would get attacked by an enolate, make something like this. You'd once again release a catalytic amount of silylium. This was our, our second wonderful idea in the lab. It didn't work for a variety of reasons. I'll save that story for another day. Uh, but uh, the thing is, when things don't work in lab, you have come up with alternative hypotheses. So our hypothesis was a synthetic hypothesis at this point. We said, oh, you know, um, really the reason why this doesn't work is, you know, the nucleophile we're using is attenuating the reactivity of our catalyst, right? It, it's more nucleophilic than basically the thing we needed to be an electro, uh, 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 be electrophile. So we had this crazy idea that we were going to use a vinyl triflate as a, uh, as a nucleophile. So for you organic chemists in the room, you know that's a bad idea. If, if basically a sophomore organic chemistry student put that on an exam, you would fail them on the spot. But we decided to try that, and, and, and really, um, it didn't work, 
What, but what happened was, this is the second uh, you know, twist in our, in our group's history. Basically, what we found is that the vinyl triflate was an electrophile, surprise, surprise, and it reacted with benzene solvent to alkylate the solvent. So Stasek Popov went and optimized this reaction. The second paper from our group was another accidental discovery where basically we had found out that we could alkylate alkanes reductively in high yield under mild conditions, and this ended up being a full article in, in Science Magazine. It's all about observation. Plan none of this, okay? So we went back again to our, to our mechanism. This is a pretty good well of trying to understand and invent new chemical reactions. And I was obsessed with this phenyl carbocation structure. And in fact, what we decided, and I actually didn't believe it. So this is from, uh, I have a joint student at Ken Houck's lab. These are expert computational chemists, the best in the world. They gave me a structure of the phenyl carbocation. And I was like, no way, that doesn't exist, right? This thing is basically aromatic. Uh, you know, the carbon-carbon bonds shown here supporting the cationic center. These are like 1.3 angstroms, really, really short. Right, the carbon, carbon, carbon bond angle is 150 degrees. It's almost like an allene stuck in the middle of this airing. So I just wanted to prove my own group wrong. And so we hired a, a chemist to come in and grow crystals and try and get a crystal structure of this molecule. And that was really unsuccessful. <laughs> it's really hard to get a structure of a phenyl carbocation. But what happened along the way is we had crystals that are really small. And so we had to figure out ways to get data from powder, basically. And so we ended up speaking to a lot of folks in the, in the, in the structural biology unit at, at UCLA, in particular, Tamir Gonin and, and Jose Rodriguez. And they tipped us off on this interesting technique called microED, uh, where they had basically taken some known proteins and through molecular replacement methods, solved structures used, uh, from really, really small crystals. And so we said, OK, we're going to try this on a phenyl carbocation. It didn't work. And I, it took a student in my lab, Chris Jones, around a year to figure out how to use an electron microscope to do microED. And so really, we sat around and we're like, oh, we got to get this guy a paper. It's like we made an organic chemist learn how to do microscopy. So what are we going to do? And so we sat around and said, OK, we'll just go to the shelf and just grab all the powders you can that are complex molecules and solve their structures using a TEM. And I think you could probably get a Jax paper. This is literally what I, what I told this guy. So he goes into the lab, grabs a bottle of progesterone, a 30-year-old bottle, and basically dips the EM grid in there, sticks that thing in the microscope, um, and basically was able to get a structure of progesterone uh, that's a high-resolution structure. In this particular case, we were able to get a structure just from one nanocrystal. It's around a femtogram of material. It's like 500 nanometers by 250 nanometers, really, really small thing. And um, uh, he was very excited. He sent the slack to the group, and they went to the bar and had a lot of fun that night. Um, but this was, you know, I think interesting. This is a commercial compound we bought. We also wanted to see if this was relevant to synthetic compounds, things that weren't uh, crystallized for, 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 for manufacturing, basically. And so we grabbed lemospermidine. This is a, a natural product made uh, by uh, Brian Stoltz in his lab. And basically, uh, it was purified in a column, right? And then we took the fractions that contained the natural product, rotovapped it down into a synth file, and then we just took the EM grid and rubbed it along the side of the synth file. So this was like a really kind of interesting way to get a structure. In this particular case, lemospermidine is uh, incredibly, has a, incredibly uh, a, a dense level of uh, nanocrystal and microcrystallinity. Um, and so we were able to get a beautiful structure of lemospermidine, um, showing here, actually, that we could even see 11 of the 13 hydrogen, hydrogen atoms on the molecule. My movie didn't play here, but we had reflections all the way out at 0.4 angstrom's resolution. We had to cut those for statistical reasons. And so here's, a, I guess, another minor story. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, what happened was, is you know, Chris had basically gotten a structure of this natural product he got out of the bottle, and he also, um, you know, we were trying to figure out what to do. That was like one figure for a paper. And so um, uh, I said, hey, Chris, wouldn't it be cool if you took a mixture of powders, basically, and then, you know, got several crystal structures in one experiment? And then there was a huge debate on our teams. There was like four PIs. And well, that's my alarm telling me my talk's over. <laughs> Sorry. I'll be done in a second. And so um, uh, basically, uh, you know, we, we devised this experiment where basically we mixed powders of natural products that we'd already gotten structures of and then wanted to go through and quickly identify them just from unit cell parameters. And we thought this would be a really nice way to look at heterogeneous mixtures and really powerful for the pharmaceutical industry, say, if you want to look at polymorphism after formulation of an API. And so um, uh, it, it, what's funny is we debated about this because we were half a team of organic chemists, half a team of structural biologists. Structural biologists is like, this is too much, dude. We publish one paper, one structure per paper. We already have 10 structures in here. And the organic chemists are like, no, we want 10 more structures and more experiments. And so in the end, we secretly did this experiment. The organic chemist on the team secretly did this experiment without telling anyone, wrote the paper without telling anyone. Uh, and, and basically, um, this is a, a, perhaps maybe one of the most important experiments in that manuscript. So 
What was interesting now, here's something else to think about. These papers, so I, I should mention that when we reported this in, on the uh, Chem Archive, it was in response to Tim Bruni and coworkers uh, who had published a beautiful paper in Agamont de Chemie that same day describing what we had been working on for a couple years. And so just a lesson for you guys, don't do things too fast. One of the biggest mistakes I've ever made in my career is not adding a citation to our already prepared manuscript before putting it on the chem uh, chemical archives. That was a disaster because that's in the history forever, basically a smack in the face of Tim Bruni. And so he's an awesome scientist and actually a friend of mine now. So uh, don't make those mistakes. Slow down. Two minutes of adding a reference won't, won't hurt anything when you're uh, in the process of getting scooped. What, what was cooler, though, is that both of these papers were rejected. So we submitted, ended up in the Social Science. It was rejected from science. Tim Bruni's paper was also rejected from science. But then two months later, it was featured on the cover of Science Magazine, one of the greatest breakthroughs of the year. So, you know, I, I don't know what that means about publications, where things go. I think you should always worry about the impact of what you're doing as opposed to where it ends up. And that's true. Okay, and so I think that's the story, uh, my story, the first three publications from my lab, um, the things that kind of, I think, define us uh, quite well right now. Um, these people did all the work and all the experiments, of course. We have generous funding from quite a few different places. I think the big lesson uh, that I learned over the past four years, and I think uh, you guys can, if, if you want, try and implement on your own, is really, you know, I think you always have to let the data drive your research more than your, your own dogma and your own ideas. And so when you get these unexpected results, you should not be fearful of tracking them down and running them down, because a lot of times those unexpected results are much more interesting than things you're planning to do. And that's, that's generally true. So with that, I, I'm more than happy to answer a question or two, and you guys can all have lunch now.